All right, so we're gonna do a presentation tonight called COVID-19 is the basics about how to keep yourself and your family safe. Um, my name is Dr. Val de Crowder and I'm an emergency medicine physician. Um, I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years. Um, I also, um, through a company called Capital Health Partners, provide um, expert medical review for um, all the medical malpractice cases that come out of the Virgin Islands for their attorney general's office. I have my contact information down there and we're gonna to try to go through this um, and go, I'm gonna kind of go over what the basic structure is. If you're gonna do a slide presentation, it'll be 20, 25 minutes. Then after that, I'll open it up and it will be Q&A. At the end of it, we should, it should be no longer than an hour as we go through everything. This presentation, we're gonna do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout this epidemic. Um, and we're gonna put up a calendar so everybody can see when and where we're um, doing um, this presentation and other events. Now, everyone is muted. You can um, uh, ask questions through the chat box. Um, you can also raise your hand. Here's how to actually do that. Um, please be patient with me. I'm doing the presentation, answering questions, and trying to figure out what's in the chat box. So uh, please be patient with me as we go through the Q&A piece of it. So now the intention of this is to keep all webinar participants informed with COVID-19 science that will help you and your family stay healthy during the pandemic. The outcome of this presentation is that you will leave the webinar motivated to create an action plan for you and your family. And then once you create an action plan for you and your family, you are motivated to create an action plan for your broader community. So that is the goal that you actually be armed with the science so then you actually can know what to do and create a plan for yourself and your family and your community. All right, so I'm going to um, not read this slide. I'm gonna uh, allow everyone to please read this slide and I'll give you a moment of silence to read it. So this was a quote uh, by the Director General for the World Health Organization. And I think it's very important because it actually signals the seriousness, the seriousness of this, but also that we can actually still, we still have things that we can do to make a difference. So what is a pandemic? A pandemic is a worldwide spread of a new disease. The, disease. the new disease must be an infection and also be contagious. And it is a new disease that people do not have immunity to. Examples of pandemics are smallpox, polio, tuberculosis, HIV, uh, bird flu, which is H5N1, um, SARS, which was also a coronavirus, and MERS, which was also a coronavirus. Now, what happens in uh, pandemics is they impact everyone. And so this is a list of sovereigns that were killed by smallpox. As you see from this list, um, it spans anywhere from Spain to Russia to France, et cetera. Um, today, we're seeing people and leaders become positive, just recently Prince Charles, et cetera. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a recently found virus known as SARS-CoV-2, or coronavirus. Before the outbreak, origin this originated in Wuhan, China, during December 2019. But prior to this, there was no information about this virus. So what is COVID-19 and why is it called that? CO stands for Corona. It's Latin for crown or halo. If you look to the right, the two dimensional view of this virus actually looks like a crown or a halo. VI stands for virus. <laughs> D stands for disease. And 19 stands for 2019, which is the year that the strain appeared. So hence, you have the name COVID-19 given to it by the World Health Organization. Why is this so important? We have all experienced a pandemic before. If you were over 64, 65, you may have experienced more than one pandemic. There are two final outcomes from a pandemic. One, a complete cure or near complete cure. That occurred with uh, smallpox, which was eradicated in 1980. It also occurred uh, with polio, which is near complete, uh, near complete eradication. Um, HIV, 
is the second type of outcome, which there's no cure, but you have some type of containment or management. So those are the two outcomes. Coronaviruses are not new. They've been around now since the ninth century BC. This particular strain is new. Now, how is coronavirus spread? It's people, it's, it's people and surfaces. So the disease spreads by person to person through small droplets of the nose and mouth. Um, and those small droplets land on surfaces and then people may touch their eyes or mouth or nose. I tell everyone to respect COVID-19, why? One, it's a droplet disease. Two, it stays on surfaces for a very long time. On cardboard boxes, it can stay as long as 24 hours. On plastic surfaces, it can stay as long as 96 hours. High traffic surfaces, you really wanna look at high traffic surfaces, doors, knobs, handles, debit card, pin pads, gas station pumps, phones, hospital workers, their shoes and their scrubs. These are the sorts of places where people are picking up COVID-19. COVID-19 also needs to be respected because it is highly, highly contagious. How do you actually calculate contagiousness? One is, what is the minimum amount of time of exposure that one needs to infect others? For COVID-19 is 45 seconds of exposure. Percent penetration. So out of how many people who have the disease, then give the disease someone they're, they're in contact with. That is 60 to 80% penetration. So these two features actually make it highly, highly contagious. Let's talk about how to prevent it. We're gonna go over three categories of strategy, preventing it, prevent spreading it, and then what happens if, if I actually get it, if myself or my family get it. So there's been a lot about proper hand washing these are actually the eight steps associated with proper hand washing. I put up this slide because many people actually do number one and maybe number two. But most people are not doing the back of the hands, they're not doing the thumbs, they're not doing their fingers, they're not doing their fingernails, and they're not doing their wrist. Sorry about that. Then social distancing, which is the next slide here. When we have our normal daily activity before we did all this social distancing, one person would in five days infect 2.5 people who then in 30 days would infect 406 people. If we decrease our uh, social exposure by 50%, then one person in five days in, infects 1.25 people and in 30 days only 15 people. If you go down to 75% um, less uh, social exposure, one person then actually infects 0.625 and those, and then in 30 days, 2.5. This basically goes over all the things to protect um, yourself from coronavirus, which we're gonna go over this plus some more, but these are the things that you've heard of. Proper hand washing, social distancing, don't touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, if you're going to actually cough, make sure to do it with a bent elbow um, and obviously um, seek medical attention if you need it. Now, I'm going to go over some things that I think need to be done in addition to CDC guidelines. So these are what I call Dr. B's guidelines. One, do not go to the grocery store. Do not go to the grocery store. Order food and medication online. For the elderly that are not on the computer, call them and walk them over the phone how to order their groceries and medications online. If someone is not as elderly and not able to get on a computer, consider having them send you the money or mail you the money and then you order the groceries and have them delivered to your loved ones. Now, what happens when you actually get food or groceries delivered to your door? There should be no contact with the delivery person, not even a handoff. Bring the delivery into your home and put it on your floor. Do not put it on a table or a countertop. Get rid of the bag immediately and transfer any food into your own Tupperware and your own containers. Clean highly used surfaces in your home frequently. Avoid using cash. Cash is another highly trafficked surface. If you're using your card for anything, 
and you're putting it in the, the pin card machines, but just make sure that you actually wipe down your cards. Do not get together in small groups with your extended family for holidays or celebrations. I know Easter and Passover are coming up, coming up. It's very, very important that you actually do not get together with extended families. We are seeing people get coronavirus in clusters and losing multiple family members. Missing your personal care services. Well, so am I. Please do not go to anyone's home to get your hair or nails done. And please do not allow anyone to come to your home to do your nails or hair or face or massage. It's just not worth it. Now, let's talk about risk factors because there's been a lot of talk in the news about risk factors and I wanna actually clarify risk factors. One, any person that is 65 years or older. Now, they talk about the elderly. The criteria is 65 years or older. So if you were born on or before 1955, that is you. I've had a lot of people say, well, I'm not the elderly because I go to the gym every day. I'm not the elderly because I run marathons. Uh, I'm not the elderly because I still work and I'm not retired. Born on or before 1955 is a risk factor. Two, people who live in nursing homes or long-term care facilities, that is another risk factor. Now, other high risk, other high risk conditions, any sort of lung condition, whether or not it's asthma, COPD, any sort of lung condition, and also any heart disease with complications. Anyone who is immunocompromised, maybe someone uh, who is uh, on can getting, can getting chemo, uh, chemo treatments for cancer, um, anybody who is HIV positive. The other risk factor that is not talked about a lot is people of any age with severe obesity. So obesity is defined as a BMI or a body mass index greater than or equal to 40. I will go over what that actually looks like, but anyone, any age with a BMI over 40 is a risk factor. Pregnant, pregnant people should be monitored since in general, they are known to actually be at increased risk for viral illnesses. However, the CDC has not yet actually named it as a pregnancy as a risk factor. So let's talk about BMI, because this is a risk factor that involves everyone of any age. Here is what a BMI greater than or equal to 40 looks like. If you're 5'2 and you're over 220 pounds, if you're 5'6 and you're over 250, if you're 5'10 and you're over 280, if you're six foot and you're over 300 pounds. And it doesn't matter if you think I'm over 300 pounds, but I'm in good shape, That it doesn't matter. Now for men, men are at higher risk for getting the disease. And once they get it, they do poorly. So let's take a look at this. When you actually look at COVID-19 infections, 58% of them are men, 42% are female. That's uh, from New England Journal of Medicine. Death rate, 2.8% of men infected with COVID-19 die versus 1.7% of women. So men are about 40% more likely to die of COVID-19 once they contract it. Now, we don't know exactly why men are at increased risk, but this is one of the things, facial hair. So facial hair has actually, is actually a surface that has been known to collect COVID-19 and give people uh, an infection. So my guidelines on this is to just get rid of it. If you have a mustache or you have a beard, just get rid of it. It's not worth it. Okay, CDC has a whole different guideline. Now, this is a chart from the CDC. It's very complicated, but it goes over what are the ones that are the okay facial hair to have because of the green check mark here versus the ones that aren't and all the different types of um, cuts have names to them. So I, I show you this to let you know that it exists. Um, I would personally just, I think it's probably better just to get rid of all facial hair. All right, clinical outcomes. 15, 1, 1,590 COVID patients in China. One risk factor increased the likelihood that a patient would require an ICU 
or a respirator or would die by 79%. Two risk factors increase the likelihood of requiring an ICU respirator or dying by 250%. Let's look at, uh, a couple people have asked me, well, are, are certain risk factors more important than others or does certain risk factors, are, are they, do they increase your likelihood of, of dying more than others? So this actually segments everything by um, death rate. This is, uh, if you're healthy, there's no risk factors, nine people out of every thousand uh, who get COVID-19 would actually pass. So as you can see, cardiovascular disease is probably one of the, the biggest risk factors. Now, let's talk about folks with asthma and those that are caring for them. This is very, very important. You want to, during this time period, avoid using a nebulizer. Someone who has a history of asthma and then catches COVID-19, you cannot distinguish between if they're having an asthma attack or if it is related to like a viral bronchitis or a viral pneumonia from COVID-19, okay? COVID-19 is a droplet disease. If someone who is actually COVID-19 positive then uses a nebulizer, it becomes aerosolized which means anybody in the home breathing it will actually become infected. So even in the hospital, in the emergency department, we are not giving nebulizer treatments under any circumstance. So what you do instead, you can use a spacer or arrow chamber. This is what it actually looks like. You put the inhaler in here, you give yourself a couple puffs, and then the medication goes in here, and then you breathe in and you breathe out. An uh, inhaler with an arrow chamber has been shown to deliver just as much medication as a nebulizer. Women who are pregnant and near delivery. People who are pregnant should be monitored since they're, they're known to be at increased risk, but the CDC has not actually determined that that's an actual risk factor. I think that my recommendation would be for anybody who's considering, uh, who has a healthy pregnancy and is wanting, wants to know what to do, I would consider a home delivery with a midwife. Action plan. What if I think I have COVID-19? What are the symptoms? So one is you can be completely asymptomatic and have this infection and spread this disease and not know it. Some people actually get only a sudden loss of taste or smell. There are also COVID-19 symptoms that are gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Then there's the respiratory symptoms that we actually hear about on the news, with the upper respiratory symptoms being headache, fever, achiness, and the lower respiratory symptoms being more like a pneumonia, fever, dry cough, difficulty breathing. What does it mean to self-quarantine? Okay, so if someone is COVID-19 positive and they're told to self-quarantine, that means literally Stay in a room or a garage or somewhere where you are separate from the rest of your family. It's important that you stay in the room, do not leave. Your family can leave food by your door um, and a minimum of 14 days. I would recommend 21 to 30. What not to do. I just saw some patients last weekend in the emergency department. I had someone who I thought had COVID-19. I went through everything about self-quarantining. He wanted to know if he could go past the drive-through at Bojangles. You cannot go anywhere. You have to go straight home to a room and be somewhere separate, okay? So do not think that because you have on a mask, you can still walk around the house or do the things that you're normally doing. Self-quarantine actually means you're gonna be in a separate room continuously. Well, some people are sort of saying, well, why don't I just go ahead and catch it and get immunity? So not particularly a good idea. One is we have not determined that if you catch COVID-19, you will actually get lifelong immunity. It seems like you'll get some sort of temporary immunity um, that is, uh, is going to wear out over time. COVID-19 sits in the lungs and appears like ground glass by CAT scan. It causes pulmonary scarring and fibrosis. Those who get viral pneumonia have a 50% death rate. 
Many people who are recovering from viral pneumonia, about a third of them have decreased lung capacity and have problems with normal walking, have problems breathing with normal walking. So it is not something that you want to just catch in order to get immunity. How to win. Early detection, early response. Universal precautions. I want to explain what universal precautions are because ev all of us on this call can implement universal precautions. Unif universal precautions mean the following. I assume I have it co I assume I have COVID-19 and I act accordingly. I assume you have COVID-19 and I act accordingly. You assume you have COVID-19 and act accordingly. You assume I have COVID-19 and act accordingly. So what is next? We will um, continue the social distancing until we've turned the corner. Um, Australia actually did their social distancing and shut down for six months. If your employment is significantly impacted by this, I, I, I really recommend that people look at what they can do remotely or, you know, some, some folks may have to get an actual different job. Um, a vaccine is 12 to 18 months away, um, and that would actually be quick. Stay informed, stay alert. Um, I recommend um, probably the best site on here is the World Health Organization. Um, you will sometimes see conflicting information, but I find that the World Health Organization is really probably the, the most reliable source. Um, you'll also see things where on the news where they're kind of conflicting. One day the CDC says they're considering asking people to cover their face in public. And the other ones, the Surgeon General urges Americans to remain at home and masks don't need to be worn by healthy people. I actually recommend that you actually do the thing that is most conservative. So I would wear a mask in public or a scarf or something and cover my mouth and nose. And that is what I do. What to do if you think you have COVID-19? There's also stuff around um, not using Motrin, Aleve, and Ibuprofen. The World Health Organization said avoid taking it because it actually made the symptoms worse. Then later on, they walked back the advice. I'm actually recommending that people actually just use Tylenol. Paracetamol is, is Tylenol. This is, this is Tylenol. So um, I'm actually recommending that if people get sick, they just use Tylenol unless they have some real reason to use Motrin. Do not go to the hospital unless you are really, really, really sick. I remind people that the emergency department, the hospitals, the medical floors, the ICUs, all have people with COVID-19 in it. So if you're thinking, geez, you know, I kind of really want to go to the emergency department and get this thing or that thing checked out, you have to decide, is it worth possibly catching it there or should you just stay at home? Okay. Two. Aggressive testing guidelines. Unfortunately, the testing varies state by state. Ideally, we would have a consistent, uh, a, a consistent policy across state lines. This is gonna dramatically make a difference and slow down our ability to actually get ahead of this infection um, and how we're actually dealing with the testing. So I wanted to actually, just on the testing, um, there was a town in Italy, Vua, Italy, Originally, what they did was they only tested the symptomatic people and they could not get rid of COVID-19. Then eventually, against public health advice, they tested everyone. When they tested everyone, they found about 10 to 12% of the people that were positive with COVID-19 were asymptomatic. They quarantined those people for 14 days. After they quarantined them, they still had about another 10% or so that required an additional seven days of quarantine. So that's why I'm telling people 21, 21 days if possible. Okay, I've already gotten some phone calls from, from people who have had family members that are actually sick. Um, I have, um, this is all of my information. Um, this phone number, this 833 phone number will be up in, by Friday. Um, I will be answering questions of people that actually have a family member in the ICU and are struggling, and I will be calling those folks back first. So if you call and you don't have a loved one in the ICU, please be patient with me getting back to you um, because I do need to tend to those that are in the ICU first. This is what the... Uh, Website looks like, you can send us a message there. This is what the Twitter looks like. 
uh, respect COVID-19, um, create a plan for you and your family. That is the end of the uh, presentation, but I, I did get asked a question about the impact of religion on the pandemic. So I'm gonna actually deal with that question up front, right? Um, unfortunately, re religion has over time played a, um, a negative role in, in, in helping. Um, it's almost been a, a, an obstacle to get around. So for instance, with smallpox in India, children with smallpox were considered to be good luck and good fortune for the family. So when the public health workers came around trying to figure out if you had a child in your home with smallpox, many people didn't want to tell them because they didn't want, they really didn't want the disease started, stopped because they thought I'm, I uh, want the uh, good fortune that's gonna come by having a child with smallpox. Similarly, um, as many of you know in the news, COVID-19, um, Iran is a hotspot. Iran is a hotspot because in January, 700 Chinese visitors visit a uh, religious spiritual monument in Qom, Iran. This particular monument, in order to pay homage to this monument, you kiss or lick this monument. So as you can imagine, people were kissing and licking this and that is how Iran became a hotspot. The government tried to actually shut down the um, this uh, this spiritual this spiritual monument, and um, the community has been um, against it. So even to this day, right now, this spiritual monument is open, and people are kiss kissing and licking it. All righty, with that, I'm going to actually uh, stop here and take some questions. Here we go. All right, Q and A. Uh, Okay, what is, okay, <laughs> that's a very good question. Okay, so the question came in and it says, how, what do I think, what is my opinion about putting medical students on the front line? Okay, so Sharon, that's a very interesting question. So I was actually in um, medical school when um, the HIV pandemic hit, right? And um, uh, at that point in time, it was called, um, immunodeficiency disease of unknown origin. Um, it, does, it does require you to um, figure things out quickly because your own, um, your, your, your own health is at risk. Um, you are more likely, um, I know during the time of HIV, you're more likely to get stuck by a needle or something, the less, um, the less, um, uh, the less uh, experienced you are. Um, and my concern with the medical students now is that um, uh, many of them are taking wearing a mask and PPE lackadaisical, they're, they're being kind of lackadaisical about it. Um, and um, they may not understand fully um, the risk that they take. Um, so uh, yeah, but uh, that's, it is, it is very concerning. All right, Annie, let's see what other question we have in here. Okay, um, two people are raising their hand, but I can't quite see you. I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. If you could type it in, um, I don't know what's, oh, here we go. There. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Um, other sources of uh, vitamin D3 while under lockdown and not outdoors. Very, very good question. So one of the things is I use a sun lamp. Um, and you can buy them on Amazon, and they're of different lumens. Um, so I recommend that people actually um, use a sun lamp because yes, that is difficult as far as not being able to be outside. Okay, am I comfortable eating fresh salads and veggies such as broccoli and asparagus? Yes, I am. I just wash it and I clean everything. So I'm comfortable. Um, I'm comfortable doing that. I just. Um, I just do wash everything very well. Uh, hold on just a second. Okay, got another question coming in. Hold on just a second. Yeah, and I'm I'm sorry, you all. I'm not able to actually. I, I don't I don't know exactly. The controls have changed and they look different. So. 
Um, unfortunately, we're only able to do this by chat today. Okay, what is being done to assure that the professional help is virus free? Uh, so um, I think that you're asking um, what is being done to make sure that we as physicians are, are, and nurses are virus free when we see you. The answer to that question is unfortunately nothing. So you could have a nurse or a doctor that is COVID positive and doesn't know it, which is why I'm actually saying that everyone should use universal precautions. You need to act like I have it. I act like you have it. We all, we all um, act like we all have it. Okay, uh, I know there's three participants who raised their hands. If you could type in the, the question, um, that would be great. Uh, I've got another question here. We've seen the importance of getting tested for early detection, as you stated. However, the United States has a shortage of COVID-19 tests, limiting access to testing. What can we do? Um, I, don't, I, I have not figured out what is the source of this quote unquote shortage, right? Um, other countries have been able to get the test. Um, I don't know why, uh, why uh, we are having such a problem. I don't know if it's a problem that has been created or if it's a, a way to try to not spend as much money. Um, and so, um, but uh, testing is critical. Um, there are a couple problems with the testing that we have now. One, it takes a week. So if you get COVID tested today, you're not gonna get the answer until the end of the week or maybe even next week. I heard that on Friday, the FDA just recently approved a 15 minute COVID-19 test, but that has not been administered out into um, the medical community for us to use as of yet. It was just recently approved. Okay. You say rely on Tylenol and only take Motrin if necessary. What would make Motrin necessary? Okay, so this is more like if when people get a cold, so this you know they're gonna they're gonna feel like they have a flu. So people often take something either for pain or for a fever, and so because we're not sure about the Motrin, I would just use only Tylenol. So if you have if you get sick and you either have body aches or fever or whatever it may happen to be, you want to actually um, uh, only take Tylenol and not take Motrin. Does the public have uh, access to N95 masks like healthcare professionals? Um, no, they do not. Um, they have taken all the N95 masks and put them in use uh, at healthcare facilities. So people who are, people who are not in healthcare um, do not have access to N95 masks. Since this is transmitted through breathing, is it a good idea to stuff cotton balls in your nose in addition to the mask? <laughs> Very interesting. Also, how safe is it to visit a grocery store? When you bring the groceries, is it necessary to quarantine the items before bringing inside the house? How safe is it to get delivery like Amazon? Okay, so what I do, I can I share with you what I do. So what I do when I get a delivery is I actually take, I have a spray bottle of Clorox and I spray the bag while it's sitting on the ground with Clorox, okay? Then I leave it out there for about an hour or two. And then when I bring it in, I actually put the bag on the floor and then I take the things out and I wipe those things down and throw out the bag, right? Um, it's not really transmitted through breathing, it's more transmitted through droplets. So you actually don't need to stuff cotton balls in your nose. You just need to cover your nose, right? So normally I will wear a, um, some sort of a, either a bandana or a scarf or something that covers my mouth and my nose. Uh, okay, family animals may tend to lick, lick you or, 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 or want your hand, how, we, how safe is it for young children assuming you are infected? Family animals may tend to lick you, oh yeah. All right, so if you, are, uh, if you are infected, you need to be quarantined even from your family animal. You should not be anywhere near your family animal if you are infected. You should be in a room by yourself. Okay, difference between droplet and airborne, okay. 
Uh, Dr. Fauci said COVID-19 is airborne. I No, I think maybe the, you might have actually gotten that. So, so let's be, let's make the, let's make the dis, this distinction. So droplet is literally a drop. Airborne means that it's in, like I can, I can actually breathe it in. So a droplet is I touch a drop and then I touch my nose or touch my mouth or and somehow or another, that's how it actually, that's how I get it. Airborne is tuberculosis. So if you think of something that's airborne, that would be tuberculosis, right? So um, now, can a droplet become airborne? Yes. If you put COVID-19 in a nebulizer machine or some sort of a machine like that, you can convert a droplet to an airborne disease. But COVID-19 is a droplet disease so but it is in the it, it does it, it can get become small enough droplets that is in the air depending upon what you do to it but it is a droplet disease yes you can share the 833 ask dr v number with other people absolutely okay rwanda okay rwanda had uh there has been what is deemed as a te technical breakthrough at uh, Batalia in Columbus, Ohio to sterilize N95 masks. Do you think this is safe and effective for our frontline workers to use this new technology? I actually don't know about that technology, um, but I know that people have been looking for ways to uh, make the N95 mask reusable, but I don't know specifically about this breakthrough in Columbus, Ohio. So information is coming very, very quickly and things are changing day by day. Um, but I do know that there's also a reusable mask uh, out of China that people are saying can be used for uh, up to 21 days and is FDA approved. Can we reuse the mask and gloves by wiping it down or disinfecting it? How many times can we reuse it? Good, good question, okay. so. The mask and gloves that we currently have, they're actually set up for a single use, but people are using them over and over again. And there, ha there isn't any particular, because we've never used um, these gloves and masks over and over again like this, no one has determined what's the right protocol for washing them, how long does it last, we're in uncharted territories. So um, you can reuse the mask and gloves. Um, I actually have something that I actually just throw in the washing machine um, because it does look like uh, heat does actually heat and bleach do seem to kill this virus. Um, so I actually uh, uh, put the things that I use in the washing machine and put it on uh, hot water. How do you feel about the sewing community being asked to make cotton masks for use by hospital personnel? Uh, well, I think that, um, you know, we need all the help we can get. So, um, you know, again, I, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have the supplies that we actually need. Um, other countries um, are getting their supplies. Uh, so I know I saw Spain actually uh, just purchased about $450 million in product from China and had it delivered. So other countries are figuring out how to protect their, their hospital workers. We need to do the same. What is your opinion about plasma donation after you've had COVID-19? Now, this is a game changer. Okay, so plasma, what happens is when someone gets COVID-19 afterwards, they have the immune, they have the antibodies in their bloodstream, okay? They can donate plasma and that plasma that can then be transfused into someone who is in critical care, suffering from COVID-19 and not doing well we are seeing dramatic improvement with that. The issue is that they're only right now are doing it in New York. So New York has an experimental protocol where they're doing it. And I have not seen where any of the other states are doing it. But plasma donation uh, of those people who have actually had COVID-19 and have the antibody is a game changer. But in general, uh, and it, it, oh, the next question was, do animals carry COVID-19? So there was a, uh, a one cat and one dog, not in the U.S. I think the cat was in Belgium and the dog was in Hong Kong that were positive for COVID-19, but they did not actually um, 
transmitted to uh, their owners, but they were found to be um, COVID-19 uh, positive. Um, I stopped taking my dog to the dog park um, because of that, uh, and um, uh, probably about a month ago. Sneezing and coughing transmits droplets for a short period of time, is that correct? So sneezing and coughing, yes, transmits droplets for a short period of time, but then those droplets land on surfaces. Then someone comes along and may actually touch that surface and then touch their nose and touch their mouth. Dr. Fauci described atomizer effect. Spray of viruses can remain in the air from a sneeze, correct? Yes, they can remain in the air and then they eventually drop down to a surface. How to encourage people with a history of depression? Very good question. This can be a really, really difficult time for people. Um, if they have a history of depression or mental illness or anxiety, um, one of the things that I think is very, very important is for everybody to at least get out once a day for a walk. It makes a huge, huge difference um, in people's mental health. I have a surgery consult appointment with tomorrow and I need to go. I have a foreign object in my finger, need to get the object out, should I go? Uh, again, I would actually say to you, um, you know, consider that those providers or that facility that you're going to could be COVID-19 positive. Uh, it's up to you to decide if you wanna go. I, I personally, I have, uh, I have something going on. I have a tooth abscess um, and uh, I canceled my appointments. That's just what I did for myself personally. Um, so that's kind of like a personal decision that you have to make, like, you know, how painful is it? Um, I, you know, that's, that's, um, uh, that's, a, that's a personal decision. What facility is collecting plasma in New York? I would have to look that up. Uh, somebody's asking me that. Um, if you want to send me an email on that email address that I actually put up or go to the website and put that in as a question and I'll look that up for you afterwards. Why not simply shut down the U.S. shelter in place for 30, for, for 30 days? Is this going to happen? Um, I think we, I, I, I again, our um, response to this has been very disjointed. Right, so one state is doing something different from another state is doing something different for another another state. Um, I do think it would make sense to just simply shut down for 30 days and actually shut it down. But um, uh, this administration has decided to have a state approach as opposed to a coordinated federal approach, which I think is unfortunate. Why do hospitals refuse to do nose swabs unless you have a fever? Um, again. Um, this is what the public health experts have decided the criteria is for getting a test. I don't necessarily agree with it, but what they're doing is because we're limited in our number of tests, they're trying to actually use it for the people that are actually sick. So COVID-19 patients um, almost universally have a fever. Cruise ships, military vessels are reporting many COVID-19 cases. What is the best strategy? Yes, um, they are. So let me just say this, anything where people are uh, close together and in the same place, um, you're gonna have a problem with COVID-19. So whether or not it's jails or correctional facilities or anything along that line um, is, going to be, um, is going to be difficult. Um, I think that uh, a couple of things, one, the military and, uh, the military is not gonna be able to really do that much as far as their military vessels. The cruise ships um, have almost all docked. There's, uh, I think they said there's still about 20 cruise ships that are out and trying to find a place to dock, but um, they're not allowing them to dock. For the correctional facilities, I think they ought to just, any prisoner that's supposed to get out this year or next year, they just need to let them out now. It's, 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 it's I'm sorry about my dog. It's inhumane to actually have them um, in the prison system. Hold on just a second. All right. Let's see. Uh, next question is, next question. Do you support wearing a mask even if you're not sick? Yes, I do. 
Yes, yes, I do. A mask or some sort of covering, uh, yes. If I have a CAT scan appointment, is it safe to visit those facilities? Nope, I wouldn't go there either. Not unless I absolutely had to. Got confirmation day that my friend's death on March 20th in Atlanta was COVID-19. It took that long to get post-mortem results as he wasn't tested before he died. He was 40 years old and severely obese male. I am, uh, I am sorry uh, to hear that, Eileen. Um, and um, yes, a lot of times they're not testing people until they actually pass. Um, I've been telling people it's very, very important to watch the death, the, de the number of deaths, not the new cases, um, because they must test for COVID-19 um, uh, as part of, uh, as part of the um, uh, post-mortem so that that way the uh, funeral directors are protected. If you have been or think you have been exposed to someone, how soon can you expect the symptoms to develop? 14 days. So if you're exposed to somebody who has COVID-19, um, you would, uh, they're saying that you would develop symptoms within 14 days. Can droplets be transferred by food and drink? Absolutely. Is there, what's the risk to, to infants two and three months old? Yes. So infants can get COVID-19. Um, kids can get COVID-19. Now they usually do better with it. They're, they usually will um, not get as sick, um, although there has been one death in the United States of a child less than one years old. So kids actually have a better outcome, but they can, be, um, they can become positive. Is it likely that COVID-19 was in the U.S. in December 2019 and we thought it was the flu due, the, due to the overlap lap of this pandemic with flu season? Um, I, so we don't, so uh, patient zero, which is the first COVID-19 patient in the world, um, had the disease in China in December, 2019. Um, and she has been identified through DNA as uh, patient zero. So they've kind of mapped out um, where it went from there. So, I mean, is it possible? Yeah, is it likely? I'd say probably not since they, they've mapped it. And she, she was a um, seafood um, merchant in the um, live China market in Wuhan. What I'd like to know is how do these new strains continue to evolve? Oh, wow, and they get smarter and smarter. Yes. Okay, so this is very important. Most of these diseases are what they call zoonotic diseases. So because animals and humans are... are uh, living in such close contact with each other, and particularly these live markets, these, these viruses are jumping from animals to humans. So these are viruses that have always been in the animal kingdom, but have not been in humans, and which is why we do not have uh, immunity to them. So that is how these new strains are evolving. Uh, Marissa, the latest news is that hospitals are firing healthcare personnel who speak on the shortages of supplies and resources. How can that be allowed in the middle of a pandemic? Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of bullying going on. And uh, yes, uh, people are trying to actually shut us up. And we're not shutting up. Um, I worked this past weekend. They actually tried to get me to take my PPE off because I had more PPE than everybody else because I had it from my own stockpile at home. And I said, I'm not taking it off. Um, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, people don't want the truth to come out. Um, what is the treatment while on quarantine or do you just wait it out? Um, yeah, you just wait it out. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no real treatment. We, we, there is an experimental protocol. If people are like in the ICU or critically ill, there is an experimental protocol. But if you're just at home, you just kind of wait it out. Once a vaccine is developed, is it likely that immunization will be mandatory worldwide? Um, I'm not sure about that. It's likely that it'll be mandatory in the U.S., um, but I am not sure if it will be mandatory worldwide. There are some countries that like Belarus is still acting like, oh, this virus is not a big deal and they're still doing hockey games. So I, I can't speak to what other countries will actually, um, other countries will actually, uh, will actually do. 
when asymptomatic people are going about their business, what's your opinion on using the military to test all in our communities? Yeah, I, I, I personally think that in order to really get uh, a handle on this, we are going to have to test everybody. We are really, and we're, we're gonna have to eventually test everybody. And it is gonna have to be a mandatory testing. So part of the, part of the, you know, part of the problem, I think the U.S. is gonna have with how, and I think it's why we're gonna have probably the worst clinical outcomes of any other country that's been infected is one, we're not insured. Two, people in general don't have paid sick leave. And three, we kind of have a culture of, you know, I get to do my own thing. You can't tell me what to do. Right. And this is actually something where, you know, you know, we do need people to actually um, follow the instructions and follow the directions because it will make a difference in the health for, for all of us. Um, there was a church in Baton Rouge that was uh, attempting to have church service just this past Sunday with 1200 people. Um, so uh, these things are uh, these things are uh, really important. All righty, we've kind of gone through all the questions. Let me see if there's anything else. If there, oh, oh. Have you seen the models for the likely death rates? Yes, I have. Yeah, yes, I have. So the models, um, the, in fact, I'm gonna actually put that on the website. Um, the model is that we would, uh, we would lose, um, we were on track without doing anything to lose uh, about 1.2 million people. Um, I think that it'll probably be uh, somewhere in the 500,000 range or so. Um, I also want to provide, oh, Rwanda's providing an update. We were all, we wanted to know Rwanda about your laptop. Okay, so Rwanda had been asked by her employer last week to come into the office to pick up a laptop. Um, and so she was on, they're at a, they're at a uh, stay home order in Ohio. So she uh, asked her employer to send her the laptop. So originally they said no, they couldn't send her the laptop. So she actually um, told them, well, if I get pulled over by the police, then I'm gonna tell them that you as the employer told me to actually violate the stay at home order. And on that, they promptly sent her her laptop by FedEx and she is now working at home in her new position. And she wants, to all, she wants to thank all of us for supporting her on the call last week through this challenging time. Thank you, Rwanda. Why are COVID patients getting pneumonia? Uh, that's just the, 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 the virus goes down the respiratory tract and accumulates in the lungs. And that's, that's where it uh, accumulates. Um, and so um, that's, just the, that's just the pathology of this. Uh, yes, we're going to do every Tuesday and Thursday. Is there a mandatory method for disposing of bodies after people have died? Uh, no, there is not. There's not a mandatory, but they do have to be tested. All righty. How many, how many deaths do you think we will see in the United States? Like I said, about 500,000, I think, four or 500,000, uh, which is a lot. It's more than we've lost in almost, you know, all the wars since, uh, since World War I combined. Um, all right, so I hope this has motivated everybody to create a plan for themselves and their family. Think about what you do, how you do it, and how you can adjust what you do so that you have less contact with frequently used um, uh, surfaces. And uh, uh, share this, you're free, you're free to come back every Tuesday and Thursday. The presentation changes a little bit with whatever updated information there is. And hopefully next time I can get everything set up so that we can take live questions and we don't have to just only use the chat box. Um, I wanna thank you guys uh, for coming on to this presentation. I want everybody to stay healthy and stay well. Thank you.